Well, good evening, everyone. Justin here from the Just Your Average Fishos live show. Don't even know what show it is, but it's the biggest one that we've done yet. We've come back. We've been working hard behind the scenes to put a show together, and we are here tonight to talk about Southern Bluefin Barrels. That's right, Barry Barrel down on the West Coast in Portland, you know, where the big fish are. You know, we've talked with Richie Abella and John Cahill about locally, and we have assembled the best panel tonight to answer your questions in the live feed. So make sure you say hello, put your questions in, because I'm going to talk to you about the wonderful prizes from both our guests and some of our supporters. Of course, Just Your Average Fish Shows, non-sponsored, unbiased, uh, and let's get straight into it. A message from obviously those supporters to us. First of all, uh, I just have to say um, what an absolute amazing prize pool we've put together tonight for you answering the questions. And the biggest one of all, of course, is a full day's midweek charter with the two geniuses, Matt Hunt and Dave Standing, who are our guests this evening. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Dave will be acting as deckhand and will also be filming for You Fish TV. Matt will be skiffering to get you onto the school fish or going for a barrel, whatever you want to do. So you need to jump on it because he's booked out a fair way. So if you are the lucky uh, winner of that prize this evening, we'll get you in touch with Matt straight away to make sure you can make that booking, get down there and uh, enjoy some bluefin fishing. Second prize this evening, uh, and by no means is uh, not a small prize, is a massive uh, tuna tackle pack from the boys down at Complete Angler Ringwood. It features everything from deep divers to hard bodies to some skirts, the whole works. Uh, there's actually a couple of things missing out of that photo. Um, there's actually a squid teaser to go in there as well. So whoever is the recipient of that prize this evening, just message me through the page and we'll get that express posted out to you straight away. And then finally, We've also got Steve Lewis from SFT Australia has come back and supported us with some of his fantastic little Takumi 125 hard bodies. Um, in Port Mac, these have been damaging the school tuna like no tomorrow. You can follow the SFT Australia page. They're not expensive, so if you don't have the money to buy hardcore hard bodies, they're about $31 each plus postage to your door from a number of reputable suppliers, and they are a great little unit, super sharp owner hooks, um, a little, like, great little uh, action on the lure. Uh, by all means, give them a crack if you're, if you're wanting to fish top water into the school tuna. All right. Now, without further ado, let's get into the show. We're going to talk barrels and catching all things barrels, fundamentally based down at Portland, but pretty much along the West Coast. We'll be guided by your questions tonight to make sure you get in there. If you don't feel your question has been answered, by all means, put it back up. We expect a lot through the show this evening. So I'm going to introduce our first guest. Our first guest, you fish TV sensation, social media sensation, bad boy barrel catcher, mako catcher, you name it. He's done it on the game fishing scene. The man's like seven foot eight, so you wouldn't mess with him down a dark alley, and nor would you if you're a fish on the end of his fishing rods because he's caught him broken. He's caught him in a, in a game harness. Dave Standing, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for supporting Just for Average Fish Shows. It's great to have you on board this evening. No worries at all, mate. Thanks for having me aboard. No worries. Now, Dave, um, you have become quite the social media sensation through You Fish TV. Could you just tell us a little bit about your fishing and how you got into fishing for barrels? Um, so it probably started uh, for barrels in particular in about 2011. I uh, did my first trip down to Apollo Bay, and that's probably um, one of the better barrel runs we've seen still to this day. I know Matt got a couple of fish there, but um, I went down there with my mate Kev. We were pretty inexperienced. Um, first day we went out, we went the complete wrong direction, and we trolled, we trolled out in the middle of nowhere. Basically, about 4 p.m., we reached where the fish actually were, and then by that stage, we got scared it was going to get dark and went in. So <laughs> and we're back at the ramp and all these boats are coming in and telling us their stories of bust offs and um, hooking fish. And we're like, oh, oh, we'll try again tomorrow. Um, so the next day, knowing what we're doing, we went straight out and we had fish, uh, big fish busting from the moment we got out there. And um, we never had a chance of getting one because we didn't really know what we were doing. But that sort of ignited the passion big time. Well done. And the passion has really evolved for you now into what would be one of the largest, if not the largest, um, sort of social media enterprises with Brendan Wing, You Fish TV. 
sort of how did you come on board with with winger on that and, and how's that morphed for you um yeah well obviously brendan did a lot of the legwork early on um he'd established um a name for himself doing a, a few um dvds and then he moved into um you fish tv through channel 31 and that sort of thing um i think we just sort of knew of each other i mean obviously i knew of him but he knew knew of me through just my fishing um i was growing up on phillip island i used to fish after school on the weekends all that sort of thing so we ended up hooking up for i think one trip chasing squid to film in the early days there and then yeah you got stuck with me still fishing <laughs> still fishing today uh well done look and you've caught a lot of barrels there's been a lot of your barrel videos um i particularly love the one where you got that quite sizable one out of port mac which is on the boat you now own and it came yeah. with a broken rod you know look it's funny what happens that barrel required some meticulous driving to uh be able to get that bugger on the boat um what would be the highlight of your barrel f fishing so far in terms of a fish or a location oh it's hard to go past the first first ones um back in the early days 2013 we um we took our boats over to our boat over to Eagle Hawk Neck and um we, we used to leave it there for the season and yeah trolling around um Hippolyte Rock there pretty famous area and um hooked up and I got to be on the rod um certainly not the biggest fish it was I think low 90s um and and the the seals kind of um knocked the fight down fight time down quite considerably um but yeah you can't beat the first one that was pretty special putting that on the deck yeah for sure and look it, it, i know that i would dream of something in the 90s probably let alone the 80s and the 60s so um well yeah. done look i'm just going to leave you just there i'm going to introduce our next guest and then we're going to get right into the information so our next guest is very well known in the social media challenge uh, uh, social media ch uh, channels um he's made a very good name for him himself fishing and catching loads of fish for many, many clients over the years. He runs a massive charter business here in Melbourne that is very, very well known. And if you're not following him on his social media, you certainly should, because if anyone's going to get you excited about fishing, it's this man here. So owner of Matthew Hunt Fishing Services, Matty Hunt, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on board and sharing some of your knowledge, mate. Good evening, Justin. Dave, viewers, uh, what a great time after this COVID lockout, eh? I was bouncing oh. off the walls. And uh, just want to thank you guys for putting together this in uh, in the tough times and should it roll on, you know, we're a community and we all buzz about barrels, but we all buzz about fishing more importantly and um, having a bit of a reward for effort in life. And, uh, yeah, great to see. Uh, fantastic. Now, you, um, you sort of um, got ahead of everyone else in, in COVID because you are a commercial operator. You could operate effectively, you know, in the COVID lockdown in some degree, but it's, it's really hit the charter industry hard, but you've dashed down to Portland. And as soon as it opened up, you scored what 127 kilo on the old flippy floppy. How was that elation for you? Like that video went viral. I was just so excited for you. I wasn't there, but I felt like I was, it was fantastic. I just did that for the, the, the fishing family I have because I'd, I'd spent two and a half months bouncing off my walls as well, yeah. I'd been re-spooling and looking at lures and checking the boat was all right and the wind each day. And as a, as a commercial operator, I can go out and run the boat and probably could have run a few lures if I wanted, but I just stayed true to the COVID thing and locked down as much as I could and, and put as much into it. As I knew everyone who was non-essential was, and um, as soon as we could work out this one and a half metre rule with an arm length each around the deck and um, also down the front of the, the boat um, and limit it to five, um, we, we became workable and, and I fished every other day since, you know, and I do that anyway. Um, uh, part of my motto is, is to take people fishing the way I would go fishing. Um, and that's why I'm vocal and I, I'm a forceful instructor because if you don't act in fishing, you pay the price and you learn pretty quickly. And that means I, I'm not a, as good a guy at the end of the day. I'm judged on what's in the fish bin and what people pay to take home with me. You know, I'm a mobile fishing peer, so to speak, and um, whether I want to charge, uh, target whiting or whether I want to target squid or barrels or schoolies or whatever it may be, um, it's always a compromise on conditions on um, angler ability, on safety, on um, time constraints, you know, um, tides. There's always so many things to think about in fishing um, and it's why I've made it my life. And, you know, I don't get up each morning and go, gee, I've got to go to work because um, the task at hand is always a little bit different. It might be more boat, boat handling orientated or it might be 
um, uh, boat positioning because I'm driving a boat on a barrel for three hours or it might be safety because the people haven't been on and I don't want them to knock their face or, or have an injury on the boat touch wood that I haven't had in, in 30 years of operation. You know what I mean? It's a, yeah. it's a tiring job and I live it and, and breathe it and, and people have got to understand sometimes my attitude is because of that, because I'm tired or because I've, I, I, I put so much into getting a result and that's doesn't come overnight, the business I've got, and that's why I haven't got numerous boats because there isn't numerous people like me. Um, so it's uh, when you book me, you get a unique character that lives and breathes the sport, that's for sure. Well, there can only be one Mr Yipper, and I have to say, look, um, I'd rather get yelled at on good instruction and boat that fish than someone who says nothing and, and lose it like, you know, and, and going home with your tail between your legs. So, look, if anyone says anything... Well, at least you're still fishing. Yeah. At least you're still fishing, mate. I don't grab the rod and say, this is how you do it. My, my crew always catch the fish and uh, anyone can argue different. I'm not standing there in the photos holding the rod, you know, not my first, yeah, that's first exactly barrel right. I targeted. <laughs> exactly right. And, look, you, you wear your heart on your sleeve, but um, no one can fault you for the passion. So thanks for coming on board. And what we might Cheers. do is um, I'm just going to swap over to Dave for a moment. We're going to come back and don't worry, there's, there's a number of questions already coming in uh, back in, so we'll get to those shortly. Now, Dave, um, tell me, now you're one of the newer charter operators in Melbourne um, and, you know, it, you've now got that to think about as well. But let's just for a moment think that Dave Standing wants to go catch a barrel and, and no, of no particular size. How do you, how would you, if someone came up to you at the ramp and said, Dave, how do I approach catching a barrel? What would be your sort of first thoughts on where to go, uh, what gear to use? Because, you know, you can buy gear for $300, you can buy gear for $5,000. You know, what would be some of the things that you would suggest in saying, all right, do this and this might give you half a chance? Uh, I suppose the number one thing is you've just got to make sure you go when it's time to go, when the fish are there. Um, yeah, I've got a few mates that are still trying to catch their first barrel and, you know, they, they could have come numerous times, but, um, you know, they didn't sort of um, put everything else aside and, and, and run down there as quick as they could. Um, you've got to be ready to move fast, uh, pick the right port, and when you're there, you've got to fish hard. Um, I like to be the first boat out and I try to be the last boat in. Um you know, there's a few other guys that do the same thing and they're the, they're the guys that catch the fish. I see Matt out there close to sunset sometimes, which is a big effort for a charter boat. Um, so, yeah, it's basically just putting more time on the water, uh, making smart decisions, and, and then all the other stuff comes with experience, the, the one percenters. Um, there's a million different little things that you can do when you learn that over time. Unfortunately, you learn a lot of it through failures. Um, yeah, I've lost barrels through various um situations and i try not to repeat that again and yeah if we can um go through some of them tonight maybe i'll save some people some tears at night because there's a few that i think about before i go to sleep sometimes so sure sure yeah so if someone's going out in their own boat and they're going barrel hunting let's say they've come down to portland and you know they're, they're prepared to get up at sunset and the weather conditions are favorable well, well first yep. of all to you, what are favourable weather conditions? Because they can be quite varied with barrels and you can have a big rolling sea quite safely down at Portland. To you, what would be okay tuna sort of weather credentials for you to head out? Oh, obviously you want to be safe first and foremost. You've got to know the limits of your boat and the limits of your skipper. Um, but, yeah, uh, rough weather certainly does seem to turn them on a little bit, especially from the southwest which is probably the, one of the more exposed winds down that way, um, tends to fire them up pretty hard. Um, personally, I think you can have a really good barrel bite on a calm day, but it's just whether or not there's a lot of other boats with the same idea as you. Boat traffic's a, a major thing. Um, unfortunately, this weekend the weather looks quite good. Uh, we're coming out of lockdown and um, there's been a few fish around, so there's kind of a bit of a recipe for a lot of boat traffic. Um, you see, if you see that for a few days in a row and the fish are, are going to sort of get quieter and quieter and then you'll find there'll be a bit of a blow and they'll probably reset and go again. And people like Matt with big boats will be out there um, catching them. Yeah. And tell me, if you want to head out for barrels, if someone said <clears throat> their first time sort of heading out on barrels, are they, are they trolling skirts, hard bodies, big skirts, small skirts, one rod, four rods? Like, What are your thoughts? Um, I like to run a five rod spread when I'm trolling. Um, usually 
mix it up a little bit. Uh, if you keep your ears to the ground, you'll you'll find a bit of a pattern at that particular time, depending on what bait they're on and that sort of thing. I mean, it seems like a few fish lately have been on those smaller lures, um, possibly because, like I think Matt was mentioning earlier before we came live, um, the fish have been on, on krill a lot. Um, so, you know, your smaller style lures is probably going to work well in that situation and when there's um, like small red bait and that sort of stuff around. But, um, yeah, generally... Um, I find that the big fish like a, a bigger profile lure, um, something that might resemble like a bigger pilchard or, or arrow squid or something like that, just more nutrients for less effort for them. Um, so, yeah, in, I, I just like to mix it up a bit. Um, I've got a spread of lures that I trust that I've probably caught fish on every one of them and I'll usually set them and, and I don't usually change it too much. It's more a matter of putting them over a fish if I'm marking fish, tying them over it constantly, I might change them up. But otherwise, I've got confidence in them and I know it works. Yep. And for someone that's uninitiated down at sort of the Portland area, um, you know, obviously you want to try and find birds to try and find some activity. And so the yep. general areas or water depths that you would like to head um, to get you started, if say someone who's a little less initiated probably doesn't have the network of friends to call and ring yeah. up and go, oh, do you know where the fish are? So if someone's a little bit blind from that perspective, but the weather's good and they've got some decent gear, where are they sort of moving to? Um, you can generally find them most commonly between probably 40 to 80 meters most commonly um you find them outside of that of course sometimes you know we've had them in under 20 meters we've had them out over you know 130 150 meters but um yeah if i was down at portland heading out no reports nothing looking for barrels i'd probably head out behind the rock there in 40 meters and start zigzagging my way down towards the border and keep my eyes peeled look for birds and just work it like that try and try and work a grid almost you know you've i know i've been through that area it didn't look that good or i've been through that area it was holding a lot of bait that might fire up in the afternoon if i don't find something better i'll i'll go back there in the afternoon and work it um just really searching yep searching what's, ground. Your, what's your thoughts on uh running teasers teasers seem to be becoming a little bit more prolific in in bluefin tuna fishing what's your thoughts on teaser and do you run one yourself uh, I've always liked to keep things simple, so we don't generally run a teaser on, on big bluefin, but, you know, we all evolve. Things are evolving. Um, techniques are coming over from overseas. They swear by spreader bars over there, and a lot of guys have been running them to good success. Um, haven't run them up till now, but um, ran them a, a bit on those school fish we had around locally a few months ago, and they certainly did perform better than just a skirt on its own. So um, there's definitely merit in that, and I'll... I'll most likely be running at least one daisy chain or, or spread of bar in the future. Yep. Um, but that's about all I can really comment on them. I haven't like used them a whole lot, but any sort of splashing and attraction that's going to bring fish up is an advantage to me as long as it's not um, jeopardizing the rest of your spread and, and causing tangles and that sort of thing. Yeah. And I suppose, would it be fair to say for someone that might be a little bit less initiated, Dave is, perhaps not to run a five-position spread, uh, um, spread straight up because they're likely to probably tangle it, not knowing you know, how to run a short a short rigger versus a long rigger versus a shotgun? Yeah, for sure, especially if you've got something big like a, a spreader bar or teaser out. Um, there's nothing wrong with running two to three lures. You're still going to hook fish. Um, first couple of barrels we caught down in Tazzle, Tassie, we only had, I think, two or three lures out because we were primarily looking to cast top water at them and we were kind of just had some lures out the back while we were moving around looking and you know we caught fish like that so as long as you put the boat over them they're still gonna they're still gonna see that lure they're still gonna eat yep now just before i switch over to matt so matt get ready uh one question that i really love to uh, talk and ask about dave is um what sort of gear and we're we're more focusing on barrels in this show so what sort of gear do you personally run or would suggest for someone at a minimum to buy to, to to get um, you know, onto a barrel and be able to hold one, so to speak? Oh, at a minimum, um, you know, your, your stuff like TLD, um, Shimano TLDs will do the job at 50 wide. Um, absolutely. Um, probably not going to last quite as long as something like a Tiagra. Uh, I run a set of five Tiagras and we've I've had the same reels for, I think, six years now of, of abuse. And, um, you know, I give them a service every couple of years and, um that's about it and they run flawlessly the drags are still smooth as and as long as you look after them they they'll last forever um 
I yep. serviced our whole lot of reels about three months ago before Marlin season and they were all pretty good internally and ready to go for the for the big tuna now. Okay, and, and so um, Tagra 50 wides, are you running yep. mono braid? Um, so I run top shot of 37 kilo mono. As I said, all the reels at um, 12 kilo at strike um, just so that we've got that option of being heavy handed on a fish if we need to. Uh, I think there's probably about six, 700 yards of um, 80 pound braid on there and then uh, about 100 metres of top shot of 80 pound mono. Yep. Um, just gives us that that big capacity, but also um, we can run the, the heavy line on there without um, potentially getting spooled. If we ran 37 mono straight through, we'd potentially be seeing the knot every now and then on some of these fish. They'll take a, a big run on the first run. Yep, okay. Well, all right. Thank you very much for some of that preliminary info. I'm going to give you a little bit of a rest now for a moment. We'll switch yep. over to Matt. Now, Matt, you've been fishing Portland for many, many years, and I, I believe um, – was it in the boat MV Reggie um, or, or Regina? I can't quite remember. Um, I was lucky enough. Many Reggie's years first ago. charter boat I had. Yep. yep, yep. And I think that was the one that I went on, would have been over 10 years ago, Port Phillip Bay snapper fishing with you. Um, but you've been fishing Portland really well. So I suppose I'm going to double up on some of the questions here. Besides someone booking a charter with you, which I could only highly recommend to, to get you understanding um, a tuna spread, the type of gear, how to go and, and ask someone of your experience so many questions. Let's say someone tows their boat down there. Um, what, what would be some of your recommendations? Like they might be the same as Dave, but do you have anything different to add there or what someone should do? Well, I can go through step by step what I would do, um, which is what any trailer boat should do. I just run a few more rods because I've got a bit more beam and a few more rod holders, um, you know. Uh, the five lure spread is, is fine. Um, what Dave said is correct. If you've caught a fish on a lure before, you've got confidence with that lure. If you've um, seen where it works the best in that spread, you know where to put it, you know what a pressure wave is, you know where you're going to maximise the visibility for that lure in the conditions you're using it in. Um, you know, I like to use my cup face or pusher lures, sort of medium to long rigger sort of length. I use um, a plunger or super plunger in the short um, with a heavy head, like in an evil colour or a lumo. Um, and on my longer ones, I like to run the the pointed nose or the um, bullet type sort of lures, um, you know, black bark, triple X, jacks, um, barrel bullet, etc. cetera, um, all get a run on my spread. Um, that's just a general rule. I've, I've caught um, uh, barrels on the short corner um, in a rainbow coloured bullet, uh, the length of my forearm too, you know, just because it was that windy that day, I couldn't get anything else to sit in the water and present well. Um, so there's a lot of factors. Um, you know, we, we've caught fish from 500 metres to 16 metres of water out of Portland, you know, and, and people often ask me, what was the thing that you got hooked on out of Portland? I used to be an East Coast fisherman, like all the guys that go to Bermagui in the room, I spent 20 years up there fishing and cut my teeth, but I, I decided to move to, to Portland because the fishing was getting better every visit I went there and there wasn't the commercial pressure that I could see in my face, such as, you know, marlin jumping on long lines, tuna boats unloading, just real demoralising stuff when you, you just go and catch enough and then you just see the whole season wiped out because someone wants a Christmas party, you know. So I just come down to Portland and we've seen the fishery improve ever since. But what hooked me on it was 2006. Rick Bartis and Dave from Paran Auto Electrics, we decided to have a trip in Rick's 23. Uh, twin two-stroke 115s, take a few jerrys to get to the shelf and back. And we had three barrels that day. We had a killer whale eat a barrel. We saw a pot of killer whales eat a school of barrels and have, you know, blood in the water the size of the MCG. And I just thought, man, I didn't see this on the East Coast. So... You know, ever since I've been hooked on Big Barry and we've chased him, as Dave, Dave said, we had a great season in 2011 where I was towing my boat for the first time down past Forest there and I had sparks coming off the brakes and I destroyed them, but we got a few barrels that week and it was all good. The five grand to fix the trailer the next week didn't even hurt as much with the, the tails hanging on the, on the fence and the smiles on the anglers, more importantly, that hadn't caught one before. You know, it's a... It's a very important part of our sport, the barrel fishing, because every sport needs its pinnacle. And and bluefin, southern bluefin um, fish over, you know, 60 to 
150, 180 kilos that have been caught in the recent years is, is certainly a trophy worth, you know, pursuing a sport for. Okay. Now, tell me, um, you opened up the season post-COVID and you opened up with a big 127 kilo and it was on the back of a flippy floppy, which was pretty popular for Richard Abella or his own designed one uh, for the schoolfish because uh, he did a lot on the schoolfish tuna while you were still busy pumping out the snapper like no tomorrow. Um What's your thoughts on teasers and, 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 you know, you deployed that, you got it out and you, know, you got the goods. Um, is that something that you will always put in the water now no matter what or is it still a conditions-based thing? Well, that flippy floppy was sort of short to long corner when it got taken and I've spoken to Richie about this. He's done a lot of development and that a lot of his better fish in the Melbourne fishery was coming from a shotgun or a long rigger position. Um, with one of his uh, special size lures and colour lures. And I give Richie credit. He really sits back and uh, analyses what's underwater and tries to match the hatch as much as anyone I've ever seen. And um, we fish different, though. You know what I mean? He has his great days and I have my good days too. And, um, you know, I, I, I fish a lot more rods and I fish differently. And that's coming back to spreader bars. People are saying, why are spreader bars um all the rage well it's just a visual thing and if you watch natural national geographic and that awesome recent tuna footage they've got of them feeding you can see when they break the ball up great ball up and it pancakes quite often there's there's a sort of a a spreader bar imitation of bait fish fleeing from the scene and that's what the fish get lit up about that's them like that's what their go is and, and that's why spreader bars work so well. And I've just got some myself. I've just spent another $1,000 on some um, TC cable spreader bars that run a keel. And they run uh, out of the wake and really maximise your spread. So when you're a beam of the bait you're trying to fish, you're going to have something in a zone you've never covered before, Justin. So we're always evolving. And I've always been a lure fisherman number one. Peter Bakula back in 19... I was 14, so I was born in 1975. Peter sent me a box of lures. I'll never forget it. Cockroaches, sprockets, all the the original colours, and I ran them till they wouldn't work anymore. There was nothing left on them. They caught that many fish, and I, I used to do it with no sounder. I did it with my eyes. You know, I did it with the temperature gauge, um, which is a very important thing for a trawler. A lot of people don't even think about. You know, the old Furuno 585's got a little graph on it and I'm always looking where there's a temperature change and it always relates to where the bait's holding, where you are on a contour, um, you know, parallel to a headland, where the water might be eddying, where the bait is finding it easier to hold or where the fish are finding it easier to ambush the bait. It's all relative to what you're doing um, and it's not just looking at the latest electronics and getting the perfect arch and bait ball and saying, oh, that's going to give me a bite, you know. It's... Uh, it's been a long road for me to learn the craft of blue water observation, I call it, and then um, turning that into results, which is what I've always strived for, which is consistency. If we get a colour that's working, there's always two or three in the box the same, even on the barrels, you know, and, and I've got footage in the past of two and three ways, and that's because I've had two or three of the same lure when the day before I went past and got a fish, I've... I've I've duplicated that and turned that into a multiple because that's what the fish are going to be turned on with, you know? Okay. So I suppose in a nutshell, there's so much information that you're providing there. Um, if I, if I just turn it down for our viewers tonight, um, you, you run a, a broader spread. You think spreader bars are good, um, picking the colour to try and find, you know, the, what's going to take the activity um, and also be, you know, able to, um, uh, you know, deploy baits that have caught fish, you know, before. Um, so uh, I think one question that's just come through, though, is why might you pick a deep diver? Because I think I've seen a video that you've already got this season. Um, why would you pick a deep diver versus picking a skirt on a particular day? Well, there's always one deep diver in the spread. Um, and if I'm chasing barrels, it's a samaki. If I'm chasing schoolies, it's an X-Rap. Um, I've got to beef my x wrap singles up because we've been pinged a couple of times this year, you know, eight or ten minutes into the fight. that just gauge on the singles isn't strong enough for the barrels. That one you saw us land on the pink and blue Samaki, I'll be quite honest with you, ever since they came onto the market, I used to use the Garfish one. I've had a few on them. We used to both 
we used to use the um, the shallow bib one and the deep bib one. We were able to triple on those uh, garfish shamakis in the early day in a similar area where we're fishing now. First light along the cliffs, you know, all of a sudden Barry and his two brothers are saying hello and it's on. Um, but then other years, you know, it's been the blue dog JBs that you can't beat or it's been a, a Bakula in a, in an evil, which is which has started it all in a short corner. If I was to start a spread out of Portland, it'd have to be a seven or eight inch Bakula evil um, right there. Um, and I'd probably put that behind a flippy floppy at the moment because what I saw that that. 127 do to that flippy floppy before he got to the lure was just phenomenal. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. He was just just before he was you having that breakfast hey, and, and tea. And, we've got some and, tea. and that's what we do lure fishing for. When you, you you explain to people, if you watch that spread, you'll be amazed at what you see. Whether you see a schoolie uh, uh, dart down and take a lure face on, and, and you'll hardly see a splash, but you'll see a, see a jumbo take a right hand turn and move more water than your boat does. <laughs> You know, it's a, yeah, I think it's we really just had a bit of a technical difficulty with your phone. We just need to get you to re-spin it for us, mate, because they've been listening to you but looking at my ugly mug, and I think you're far more attractive, mate, with those those glasses. They make you look very distinguished. Mate. I think that's a lot better. I hope they've heard me all right, mate. I'm mate on the, they've heard you. I told you I'm on the 5SE. It does all my filming on the boat. It's water damage. It's got a cracked screen, but we're still rolling. It's all right. All right, we're going to send you a new phone, mate, as uh, gratitude for coming on the show. <laughs> All right, look, lots of info. So you've got them on the deep divers as well. Now, a question that's come up, um, no one seems to use live bait for barrels, and is that because of seals? Why not? Now, um, Dave, you you caught that big barrel in Port Mac. It started off coming on a couple of frozen pillies on a hook, I believe, cast into a busting school because they weren't taking lures on top water. When might someone cube or a result to that versus running a spread? Oh, well, first of all, people do use live baits and have for a long time. Um, just when the situation determines that that's the best method is when you go to it. Um, yeah, when, usually I, I like to say a, a busting barrel is probably one of the harder ones to catch um, <laughs> when they're more spread out um, feeding on various baits is when they're they're kind of more in hunting mode and they're they're a bit easier to trick onto a lure but when they're locked in on that really small stuff and they're busting hard that's all they want so you know you can cast or pull every lure you've got through there and i have done it in the past and you know they're likely to ignore it um so it's usually a time like that you know you, you fish it ignoring ignoring the lures they're locked in on a smaller profile bait and um, that's that's when I'd probably go to pitching a live bait or a pilchard in. Um, yeah, that fish last year we um, we had barrels all around the boat. We cast every stick bait we had. We towed every lure we had over them. And I said, well, we're just wasting our time doing this. If we want to do this for the rest of the day, we're going to catch nothing. And we all agree, we all agreed with that. And um, and uh, Mark Schulte, who we were out with. Um, the madman, he catches a, a lot of barrels. He, he um, whacked two pilchards onto a onto a Maruto hook and um, he stripped it down. And interestingly enough, he didn't strip it into where the fish were actually busting. He he pitched that next to a, a pack of seals and let it sink down next to them. And and a fish that was working a deeper bait bowl came through and grabbed that. So, um, yeah, so he went to switch to bait fishing um, when, it, when nothing else works. <laughs> That's probably what I would suggest. And when okay. those fish are busting and they're locked in on, on a on a bait fish profile. Sure. Okay. Now, question for Matt. Um, and this is from a good supporter of our page, uh, Brock Eli. So he says, uh, Matt, so I've heard that tuna eat up to 15% of their body weight each day. If this is so, why can we have them on the sound for hours? It doesn't matter what we do, what we try to get a bite out of one fish. Uh, when you know you've you know got tuna under your boat and you try everything, um, and, 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 you know, you get one of them to bite, but they just won't go hard. What, what's the trick? Is there any trick to making them feed or is it a, is it a tide change? What? Got to wait for them to digest their food, yep. Justin, as simple as that. Um, you know, a lot of the fish I've caught this year, and I've had a cracker of a season because I've, I've had it to myself um, and being Johnny on the spot a lot of the time. A lot of our, said said to Dave early on, you know, two and three lures just in the water. A lot of my bites have been just the third rod in. I, I've just... You just set the spread and I'm over a bait ball and bang, it's on. Um, so as long as you've got one presentable bait there, um, you're in with the show, you know. And I, I've done a lot of this um, bait ball 
uh, dropping with re- uh, frozen red bait, pillies. I've burlied. I've done a lot. You know, I've caught a lot of seals. Um, birds get tangled. They take the bait and all that. And um, Dave's right. If I, I, I do it when I can see the fish and I'm just heartbroken. I've done that many passes and angles and, and emptied the box on the spread um, that I just have to pull up and throw something at them. Yep, not a problem. And another way people fish for them is at night on the full moon. Um, the boys out of Port Ferry, when they had a good bite out the front, they had a fish by 7 o'clock. I think it was dark at 6.30. They had a fish by 7 o'clock on a Californian, you know, just on a running sinker rig down below a bait ball that was firing throughout the day or pretty slow on the lures, but we knew the fish were there. They just went out, waited for sundown, dropped the squid down and bang. But interestingly enough, the fish were full of nautilus that year. So they were feeding on an upwelling out of Lady Julia Percy and, and they were eating a, a sea snail. So, you know... Um, just depends on what they're doing and what the diet is, whether whether you're going to be in the ballpark for a result. You know, otherwise you're going to be getting sharked and sealed and and gannets and it's just just becomes a menagerie of everything non piscatorial. Mm, okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, especially to those that might be a little bit um, less confident dealing with a gannet at the side of your boat and, uh, you know, too many leaning over the side of the boat and a decent swell isn't conducive to a lot of safety as you speak about. Now, here's a good question um, from a good friend of mine and fellow Mitcham Club Angling member, Ben Saunders. So if running skirts and bibbed lures, and I'll ask this to both of you guys, um, so I'll start off with you, Dave. If running skirts and bibbed lures, do you focus on a slower speed to keep the bib lures swimming properly or do you focus on the skirt skipping in and out of the swell if that's what the head is? So, Dave, what are your thoughts? Um, I pretty much always run at least one diving lure. Uh, I've got a pacemaker here. Matt was speaking about them before and um, I think I was running them pretty early on as well and had good success on them and um, that could have been because the fish hadn't really seen many of them at that time. Um, So I usually do have a mixed spread and um, I tend to pick my bib lure. um, I pick the one that's going to keep up fast enough and not blow out so that the rest of the spread can still work at the same time. Um, The one that can work to a high speed perhaps. Um, which yep. is more conducive to trolling skirts. Yeah, yep, um, for sure. Yeah, but um, the other thing is skirt. Sometimes a skirted lure worked a little bit slower is what gets the bite. I mean, the fish have a little bit longer to look at it. If, I, if I'm marking fish and I've cut a few laps around the area, I will vary the speed. Sometimes you slow the boat right down, down and they'll eat that lure. Um, it can, you know, your bullet head that you've got way out on shotgun can sink down a little bit. So it's little things like that, changing things up that can draw a bite at times. Okay. Now, Matt, what are your thoughts? Because you, you, you've you got a very big spread and, and you know, you're picking a speed for skirts or, you know, do you always have the deep diver out on the side or? The Smarky will cop 17, 18 kilometres or okay. eight, nine knots, probably more on some boats depending on the position you run it. But I run it relatively short. So my double is just off the roller on my big rods, so that's a wind-on sort of length yeah. and a double in. Yep. Um, but I generally run at 10 or 12 kilometres an hour, so five to six knots. Um, I can push the Samarkis to eight or nine, as I said, um, but the Rapalas won't take much more than, than that five or six knots. And I find, guys, just wear sunglasses. If you're trolling deep divers, the, when they slingshot back, just please, 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 just make sure you're wearing sunglasses if you're looking out at the spread or glasses. Yeah. Because they come back at a million miles an hour and, and um, you know, especially inexperienced guys that get get the boat running down a swell just before they've got a handle on what the boat's going to do in that the conditions they've got for the day. You can end up doing 20, 22 kilometres an hour and this thing slingshots back and, yeah, it can be a disastrous thing. So divers can be dangerous, but they can ignite the spread even without getting a bite, Justin. You know, I like to say this to people. Um, they can create interest when the schools are hanging a bit low and then by the time the fish get into range of the divers, they see the more attractive or they get the colour into vision of what you've got in your, your skirt spread and your skirt spread um, will go every time and your divers won't even indicate that they're working, but that's what's getting the fish in the zone to see your lures. Um, you know, I look and have done that many hours looking at the spread and um, for schoolies, if I don't have two X-Raps running dead straight, tuned either side of my bubble trail, I'm not as confident as, as I would be, you know, with, with the Samaki out, say. Um, okay. But if I want a barrel, 
the first rod in is the Samaki in the middle because it runs under my bubble trail, um, which acts as a bit of a teaser, um, and it tends to be the one Barry takes first thing in the morning. And do you uh, find, Matt, that um, you prefer to take off the trebles and put just a single on the back? Do you find they still swim okay? I saw Dave set up there and, um, you know, another fella I used to hang around with did a similar hook off the front clip of the reel, uh, of the lure, uh, off the front toe, the front hook point. But I, I run uh, triple X uh, or three times X uh, strong trebles on mine now, Justin. The fish we got on that, that fish this year was a, a bit of a reaction to what uh, someone told me that uh, Big Richie said about me showing a bent treble last year. So I went and got some stronger trebles and there's a the result. The fish is in the bin. So there's no doubt in my mind, um, uh, if you get a single uh, hook up like Dave's on that uh, uh, corner jaw or, or, or a solid point, it's pretty unbeatable. But also these, if you've got trebles and split rings you've got confidence in, I'm nearly as confident on the deep diver having two two chances at nabbing him. You know what I mean? Um, I've, I've had too many zips and, and um, borders deep diver backwards. Obviously had a hit and missed when I was trying that front or, or single hook, you know. I just, it more is better as far as I'm concerned with the divers. I'll go one more question before I throw a couple at Dave. Matt, I'll go one more with you because while we're talking hard bodies, um, some people and we didn't go into this on the Richie show, is how to tune a hard body because they can be prick of things if you don't know what you're doing with them. Have you got any sort of advice or any tips or techniques to make a, a deep diver run better in the spread? Oh, definitely. Um, match the weight of um, uh, terminal tackle you put on, so your split rings, um, your trebles mate, or your singles, Make sure they're in line or, or you know, everything lines up. Uh, when you've caught a fish on them, there's three things that can make them not work. It's both the, the hook toe point, or the hook connection rings um, or the single wire that goes through. If a fish hits that and it bends one, um, it'll make the lure throw out or it's that front toe point. All you need is a long nose pair of pliers that you use to de-hook the, um, the tuner with or, you know, just a, a pair of long nose bent pliers that you get the Neptune, I think they're Neptune tackle or... They're used for ganged hooks up in Queensland when people are using mackerel um, rigs and stuff like that. They're relatively cheap. They're um, stainless or chrome coated. And, uh, I just use them to, to tune my deep divers. If the lure's going left, a little bit to the right. It, it is tedious as hell some days because you haven't picked up that the back um, hook point has been twisted a little bit or it's um, been bent over to one side. And that's, that's part of the art, finding um, whether you need to untwist it or just unbend it a little bit um, and it's easy as you go if you go too much it'll just throw the lure totally the opposite way and, and you'll end up throwing the thing in the um, in the side pocket and don't be surprised if you end up doing that anyway but I, I just through years and years of towing these things um, can get back out there and have them running true pretty pretty quickly you know but even sometimes it takes me five or six test swims to get them going again because my lures just got everything worn off them, you know what I mean? Yep, yep. And one, I'll just throw in an extra one to you, Matt, because this has just popped up from Ben, our producer backstage. Uh, Wade Jones, Matt, do you run an extra ring on the treble so they can rotate more? Um, no, I don't. I do if I wanted to use a single like Dave set up um, or a twin like that so the conventional hook can sit straight, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, when I haven't got the use, I used to, I had to go with a blowtorch and, and twist the conventional hook to turn it into an inline that uh, created a weak point in the stainless. So to prevent that, we used two, um, two split rings together to get that angle right. So the, the normal hook can sit as an inline. That's when I would use, um, two split rings. But other than that, I just, I go trebles on the barrels and I use decoy or, um, mustard singles on the the X wraps, but I've got to find something with a heavier gauge. It's just, um, it's heartbreaking for me when first rod in goes and it's an X wrap and they're a great lure, but 
Um, I just can't get them to swim with these these uh, triple X strong trebles that the Samarkis will cop, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm um, 100% on that. And uh, if uh, anyone's listening out there, uh, one of the – John Cahill from Ebb Tide Tackle sells Shout, and you can buy Shout from a lot of reputable um, uh, tackle stores, the Shout Kakudos, they're an inline. Um, and they do them both with um, uh, a little bit of the rigging uh, sort of Dacron so they can swim a little bit more freely or they sell them as a ringed hook as well. They're in line and they're really sharp and extra thick as well. So uh, give those a go. Um, all right, Dave. I'll be another... getting on to them. Thanks. Yeah, get on to them. Um, shout that. Kakudos, ebtidetackle.com. Go, Johnny. Um, you're a ripper. All right, William, Ryan, Dave, question for you, mate. In relation to the birds as an indicator, is there a specific type of bird that you want to be looking for or is it any birds in general? Uh, they, can, they can be under any bird. Um, gannets are the one you want to find. Gannets okay. are usually feeding on that bigger bait and that bigger bait's usually what the barrels will prefer to be eating. Um, if they have a choice between a, a, a small morsel and a, a big fat pilchard, they're going to be on the pilchard most of the time. And that's what the gannets are feeding on. So, yeah, ideally gannets. Uh, we pulled fish off martin birds, terns, all sorts of things. But um, gannets are a good sign for okay. sure. All right. Um, <clears throat> you know, a load of things. Oh, here we go. We've got more questions coming through. All right. Um, one for you again, Matty. Um, if you had any specific uh, preference to size lure, what would it be? A size skirt, that is. Oh, eight inch, seven inch, um, six inch. What Richie's talking about on the back of the flippy floppy, um, a lot of our multiples over the years um, were getting to that train of thought of that <clears throat> National Geographic fleeing bait fish type scenario. I use polar kais, I think, in six inch, very heavy lure. So they sink on the turn um, and have four or five set up in the spread at a very similar line. <laughs> And quite often we'd tempt two or three fish on those. But once again, we were catching school fish and barrels and, and the barrels would always hit us when we had the, the set up sort of geared towards schoolies. When we put a bit of an effort in, things have gone quiet and we've got to get a result to, to make people think they're getting their money's worth or to kill the boredom, to stove off seasickness or whatever. When a true barrel fisherman, as Dave said earlier on, will fish dust to dawn, all tides, he'll fish, you know, rough, uh, sh uh, shallow, deep. He'll he'll do things out of the box. Do anything to try and entice that that one bite. Whereas we have to go back to getting results a lot of the time to stove off seasickness, boredom, or just to get people to come back and have another go. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. All right. Now, one for you, Dave, because you've got probably the to the to the uninitiated. You've got more of the you know uh, you've got an offshore six meter boat, and it's it's we're not all driving down there in size of uh, Matt, Matt Hunt's boat. So Pat Allaby, again, a, a, a wonderful supporter of the show. Once a big barrel is hooked and he's running deep, what is the best way to manoeuvre with the boat to try and get him up to the surface and put the herd on the fish, I suppose, Dave? Um, I see people drive a bit too much on barrels sometimes. Um, obviously, when they are slugging it down deep, you need to move off a little bit, get that line angle a little bit further up and you can work them up that way. Um, a fish directly under the boat is obviously going to be harder to lever up than one that you've got angle on. Um, but if I can just speak a bit more broadly about it, um, the way I like to fight barrels is um, I like them taking a big first run. Um, you often hear people say, yeah, he took a massive first run and he was buggered. That's what you want. You don't want a fish to trickle a little bit of line and sit there slugging it out with you for four hours. Um, so if he doesn't do that on his own and take a big first run, sometimes we'll try and get it to do that. We'll, you know, we'll play with that drag a little bit, give him a bit lighter drag, let him get moving and then bump, bump that drag up a bit to put some hurt on him. Um, the last thing you want is that fish just paddling along next to the boat because they won't get tired. I mean, what you're doing there is what you do when you want to revive a fish. So, um, yeah, try and get keep the fish moving. Um, either have the fish taking line or you gaining line. Don't let them just sit there and get their energy back. Um, if the fish is deep, move off it a little bit. Um, yeah, just yeah, don't let them get into a rhythm because they can do that for five, six hours and you, you hear these monster battles sometimes and it's not because it's a big fish, it's because 
the fish was just stubborn sitting there and conserving its energy and you know you've let them let it regain its energy a few times throughout the fight and it's gone again and um if you want to knock them over quickly keep them moving yeah and no, i think probably also in addition to that dave i'd recommend people watch uh that you fish tv video of you catching that that big barrel in uh, Port Mac um, because there was some major thrust, reverse thrust going on in that boat to try and oh. keep on that barrel. And it, and you weren't in terrible conditions. And to the uninitiated, if you're in a decent swell and you start putting the foot down like that into the uh, in, into a big swell, you'll have waves breaking over the back of your boat if you're not careful. So um, Yeah, be, be, really be careful. very careful doing that. Yeah. Uh, well, you guys are obviously very experienced and know what you're doing and and um, yeah. and so forth. But um, to, to someone that might just have the five and a half metre, you know, stubby craft or Quintrex out there um, and, and giving it a shot on a bad day because it's the only weekend he's got free, uh, if you're reversing up on a fish, have a spotter, watch what you're doing because um, yeah. you cop a big, decent wave. It's a good night, Nelly. All right, Matt, I'm going to run back to you for a sec. Um, uh Here's a good one from another great supporter of the show, Wade Jones. How important is underwater structure in the way that tuna move around? Um, do the bait follow the particular contour lines, Matt? Yeah, definitely. Um, different years, different flows, different temperatures, different areas. Um, you know, Bridgie's a good one. Um, the front face uh, down 19, what we call 19, down to 17, always holds fish to start a discovery bay. Um, then you come back up to 25, 25, and that's the first point of Bridgie. And the fish, the bait holds there for a bit, and then it goes out off the light a bit into like that 70 metre range. Um, I caught fish south of the light in 100 this year. That was where that krill, I found that krill sort of upwelling out there. Uh, and then they're back in at Cape Grant, you know, in 40, 50, where there's been bait holding all year. So um, depends on the flow, the weather. Um, we've had a lot of heavy weather this year and that, that moves the bait around a lot. But they'll, they won't go far, you know, they'll be within five kilometres of where you found it. And as Dave said, it's, it's you start uh, at the back of the rock, you head west and you take note of where you find the activity, where the water looks the best where the concentration of bait is, where it's up top, where you're marking schoolies, um, you know, get your temperature set to Fahrenheit, make note of where the temp breaks are because the tuna will be in that better water temperature that allows them to uh, expel a bit more energy, you know, or where the bait's hanging because that's a bit more comfortable because of that that's minute change, you know, because of the different flow or whatever it may be. So many one percenters, you know, we've caught barrels off one turn, no birds out in, the, out in nowhere in the middle of the hottest action, you know. Um, dolphins has been a big thing this year. The guys you've heard have caught the transit fish down the coast a bit down towards Port Campbell and that. Um, the fish have been blind to them, um, but in an area and, and consistent bites for a few days and then they're gone, you know. We've had that here out on the shelf, um, you know, just when we've run lures, um, when we were on the way home one day where we wouldn't normally and bang out of the blue and, you know, over a couple of weeks you see a few shots, you know. You just never know where, where these fish are going to turn up or what they're doing. Yep, sure. And and another one just to follow on from that, Matt, uh, Kai McLean, does the chlorophyll bloom concentrations make a difference with barrel fishing in your opinion? In your opinion? Oh, I don't it's got got to be. Uh, it's got to relate some way. I haven't put my finger on it 120, percent but I've seen bait this year actually feeding on microplankton and stuff like that, where where we normally see bait getting chased and herded and eaten. This year on the calm days, we see it rippling like like, like we used to see it, the Trevally ripple up at the Montague Island up the east coast and stuff, and that means the the pillies or the red bait or whatever white bait or whatever I saw that day was actually feeding on the microplankton and and gets back to the correlation of the, the, the krill I was saying out wider and and um, the stuff we can't see going on. So, you know, the amount of dolphins here this year is immense um, and there's definitely a relation to hookups and seeing um, dolphins around your spread when you do hook up. The barrels and the dolphins are travelling together or have done so far this season, you know what I mean? Um, and when you see uh, seals in a particular area, um, definitely... Um, it means there's a bait ball and when you see them porpoising the seals up and down in one area, they've definitely got bait herded and, and you know, five times out of ten there'll be a barry not too far away. And the other thing, we don't like to get too close to them, but whales, um, Justin, this year 
we were marking fish right next to whales. And what happens when the whales are feeding on the meatballs we're marking up, the tuna quite often flank the whales either side and feed off the waste coming out of the whales' gills. You know, they're freeloaders. They're like a remora, um, the, the barrels. And, and some of the reports of the markings coming off whales this year um, means the fish were just doing the thing. But people have got to understand why we think out of the box and think about these new spreader bars with keels and different wings on lures and different additives. And um, while the wheel keeps getting reinvented is because these fish change and they realise what when they're at risk and when three of their mates have been taken doing that and they'll learn not to do that and that's how they get that big the, the species evolves and learns with us you know and and what worked before doesn't always work again it can um, and does a lot of the time but when the pressure gets to a certain stage it works less and less so um, you know some guys have got it figured out and um, some guys just have a fluky run like me you know what I mean but you know we're it's, that's the beauty of fishing and why we go each day. It's a, it's a new new sort of sure. chapter and it's really challenging. It's good. Talking about evolution there, Matty, um, just for a moment, I'll interject in the sense of that um, I'm really excited and you'll see some stuff coming out if all of our followers follow Complete Angler Ringwood and I'm doing some social media consulting and bits and pieces for them at the moment. Uh, and Ian Loft, the owner of Complete Angler Ringwood, is a massive uh, friend and, and family friend for many, many years of Pete Bakula like yourself. And Bakul is about to release some really unique skirts, um, the first of their kind, which is a fish printed skirt, which has been used in Hawaii on yellowfin tuna and so forth. And what you use is the different heads in your different positions, but you run all the same fish printed skirt to create your own bait school. And, and the, the championships just pre-COVID that Pete was able to get some lures in Hawaii on the big yellowfin tuna bite and so forth said that their their strike rate was just phenomenal. So I'm really excited to, because that that is a change. You know, it's still a lure, it's still a skirt and whatever that swims as it does, but um, no one's ever decided to do a printed skirt in that manner. So I'm really excited for that. Um, all right, Dave, um, here we go. Uh, in your view, um, Mark Powell has asked, is there an optimal temp or temp break or moon phase to look for when targeting barrels? Um, they live in a very wide range of water temps. Um, generally on the southwest coast in Victoria, we see the, the big barrel season really kick into gear um, once that water sort of uh, gets below 15, you know, below 14 degrees. Um, that could be because it, it thins out the school fish a bit and the big fish have more of a tolerance. They hang around a bit longer. Um, the, the nutrients and that's still there for them and and we don't have the, the school fish sort of getting in the way of the big fish getting to our lures. Um, so in terms of optimal, not really. Um, as long as the bait and feed's there, the fish will be there. Um, you know, we've caught them when the temp's as low as sort of 11 and as high as 19 and a half. Um, just, yeah, it's a matter of putting that, that time on the water and, um, um, yeah, they'll be there throughout most of those, um, temperatures and I don't really have a particular favorite. Um, what was the other part of the question? Sorry. Oh, just, um, moon phases, uh, for targeting, um, barrels or, uh, and I'll go back to Matt on, on this as well, but do you have a preferred yep. moon phase as well? Uh, yeah, I, I really like the, the lead up to the full moon, um, tend to find that they um, may feed pretty hard on the lead up to the full. Once you get right up where that, you get the full moon, um, you'll find that the, the bite will be sort of either very late or very early mostly um, as they start to feed into the low light and throughout the night. But um, something about that lead up to the full tends to turn them on pretty hard. Um, like I said, you know, you'll catch them all through the moon phase. It's, it's not going to stop me going down there because the moon's at a particular position. Um, yeah, even though I just said, you know, the, on the fall, they tend to feed early and late. I've hooked them at smack bang in the middle of the day as well. So, um, yeah, absolute favourite would be lead up to the full, but um, I'll go down there anytime. Okay. Now, Matt, you were just talking about temperature breaks before. What sort of temperature difference in the breaks are you looking for? And do you have a preferred uh, tide or moon um, for barrels? High tide, um, temp break is a temp break. You don't go looking for for a, 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 an amount. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it just ends up what it is, eddy to eddy. Um, depending on the flow and all that, but we're seeing, you know, the the start of the season. <clears throat> pardon me, the start of the season, for instance, sixteen degrees, fifteen point four to sixteen point two was the the range. And if you were fifteen eight to to sixteen, you you knew you were on the money um, for the bigger fish, and and that still applies today. It's just. You know, we get Arctic blasts here and, and some of the footage you've seen, a bit of heavy weather stuff the last couple of days, that, that'll knock a degree off, um, Justin. But with the forecast we've got, that degree will be back um, at the end of the long weekend, you know what I mean? Weekend, Coming man. on to moons, um, you know, uh, as Dave said, um, full moon's always a, a better time for the barrel bite. Um, more bites of barrel proportion come in. Um, but as he said, uh, you've got to be Johnny on the spot, either first or last light. You've got to hang in or you've got to go early. Um, and, you know, the new moon's been okay for me at, at times. But definitely as a whole, you know, that full moon, high tide, um, first first sort of um, hour, hour and a half of the day, you know. Yep, fantastic. Okay, now here's a question to um, both of you, If uh, and we'll, we'll just lead off with you, Matty, but Dave, uh, after Matty gives his opinion, by all means adding yours, Mark Powell, last time we went out, the tuna we caught were always when we had the sun at our backs. As soon as we turned around, had the sun in our eyes, not a hit. Is that a coincidence, or does the direction of trolling compared to where the sun in the sky make a difference? Matty. Not to the sun in the sky, to the sun into the sky to a certain extent, but more importantly to where the fish are travelling to where they see the, the your, your lure. So it could be the reflection from the sun, or it could be the position of the fish, the depth, or the angle they can actually see your offering. Um, you see it on the depth sounder when we go over fish; they're either coming up and you'll expect a, a, a bite, um, or if they're shying away, you'll see them actually swimming down. And a tuna can't sort of move his eyeball that much. His nose has got to be pointing to where he where he's looking, if you know what I mean. So the actual aptitude of the tuna matters a lot. Um, sometimes you'll be going over barrels and they just won't, their side of vision won't be looking at you because they're concentrating on something at a different angle. You know what I mean? And that's where angles can come into play because you'll get that shine off that witch doctor you've got down that'll use, that'll work this one time because of that angle and, what you're trying to do, it'll get the attention that one time. And if you can um, recognise that rather than saying, oh, it's because I had my favourite lure in that position, that's why I got that fish, that's where you can multiply what you get out of what's there and and that's part of the craft, you know what I mean? Yep, sure. Dave, um, do you have any sort of preference to whether you're into sun or trailing behind? Uh, what Matt's saying is pretty spot on. Um Yep. Yeah, if I had to guess, I'd say that he was probably travelling in the same direction that the, the fish were feeding and they just had a better view of his lures in that direction. Yep. Um, yeah, certainly the sun, sun hitting the lures from behind the boat might have set off that particular colour or that, that flicker that triggered a, a feed. Um, you know, if, if, if the, the, the glitter or the glint in the lures light up a particular way, you know, might they might think that that, that bait has been attacked and it's injured. Um, might trigger them into a feeding mode. Um, you know, when you see a bait ball getting getting worked and you, you go over the top of it, it's, it's like there's glitter in the water just sinking everywhere because that's the scales have been all ripped off. Um, so, you know, the sun glinting off the lures like that from behind the boat can potentially um, replicate that a little bit. Um, and that might may have been why. It, yeah, like I said, it may have been they were travelling that direction. It may have been coincidence. It's... Um, you know, it's hard to know sometimes. Follow-on question for you, Dave. Um, obviously, <coughs> there's certainly other places other than Portland that have got some big southern bluefin credentials. You mentioned Apollo Bay before. Port Ferry yeah. one that's really good as well. And then if you want to head over to the border, Port Mac. Why, why would someone want to head to Portland as a preference, in your opinion, versus just going to Port Ferry or, or, or Apollo Bay? Oh, Port, Portland's an incredibly... Um, uh, an incredibly good fishery. Um, it's got a lot of um, underwater rock formations, which tend to hold bait very well. It's it's got water reasonably close, um, deep water, sorry, reasonably close to these inshore locations. So um, a lot of food is is delivered in in there by the currents. Um, most of these big barrel places all have very good reef structure, and that's what tends to hold the bait. Um, Portland's certainly got 
some of the best out there. There's just so much ground that could hold bait and fish. There's nearly, you know, bait in Bridgewater Bay, for example, 12 months of the year that would sustain a, a school of barrels. Um, so, yeah, Portland, you know, you've got so many different locations to work from the rock through to the, the border there. Um, yeah, if you were just, if you were going to visit anywhere first up, it would probably be, be Portland for that reason, just a very consistent fishery. Yep, cool. Now, Matt, um, you've been fishing Portland for many, many years and you've probably, you know, look, any, every boat ramp that has a beginner on it can become amateur hour at certain times. And um, we've all spoken on the Just Your Average Fish Show show about, you know, please be respectful with other boats around and particularly charter operators, you know, don't just generally nosy along behind them and so forth. But if, you, if I was to ask you, and I love asking all of our guests on the show this same question, if I was to say what are five critical things that, pieces of short pieces of advice that you could give to a new boater heading down to Portland or someone who's even a very experienced boater that not, might not be having much luck. What are five critical things that you, you would share with them to say, hey, try these five things or make sure you've got these five ducks in a row to increase your chances? What, what, what might they be? And it might not be five, it might be two, it might be ten. What, what would you say? Number one is a safety thing, Justin, and I hate to say this, but make sure someone's on the wheel. 100% of the time. Don't just go out there with your mate and because you're keen as, just let the boat go along at your 10, 12 kilometres and just think she'll be right. And just, there's cray pots, there's floating debris, there's trawlers, there's cray fishing boats, there's Matty Hunt, there's all sorts of things you can <laughs> do out there. And safety's key, you know. We had an issue here last week and, you know, we all put our opinions across and I put my opinion like no one else. But the main thing is that this is a recreational sport and people must, must, must respect the fact that we're fishing on the ship, shipwreck coast. It's not called the shipwreck coast for nothing. It needs all the respect in the world. And there's a reason I've got a bigger boat than everyone else. It's not because I've got a small appendage or a big whatever it may be. It's because it's what I need to make a living safely and it's what I need in the Southern Ocean to come back in the weather I fish. Um, trailer boats aren't the same so please don't try and emulate what I do. I'm more than happy to give people at the ramp adv advice if they're unsure. Um, I'm, I'm, I've guided people back that have gone out of their depth um, many a time. Just because you've spent 100, 200 grand doesn't mean it's going to get you home if you haven't got the ability. Um, and the ability is not always on call when you're under pressure or you're in a panic mode or you think you're not going to get home. So that was the first thing I'd like to say to everybody. Yeah, well said, well this said. long weekend's yeah. going to be fantastic. The forecast is great. You want to go out and catch a tuna. You've got your five rod spread. Um, I'd put a bullet lure out on the shotgun, something similar. A pusher style or a longer style um, sprocket on my long or medium riggers. Um, I'd have a, a plunger style lure on my short corner or a deep diver um, in close. And, um, you know, I'd set out, as Dave said, south of the rock somewhere. Even If you want to push further west, you can start at the light. And I'd be working between sort of 30 and 100 metres of water, looking for activity, looking for clear, clean, crystal blue, purple, fishy kind of water, looking... Um, at the amount of debris and the green water you've got to go through to find the active water, the birds, um, you know, the temperature you want about, you know, 15 and a half to 16 at the moment. And, you know, I'd be, I'd be trawling around about 10 to 12 kilometres an hour. Um, and if you want barrels, you're going to have to search around the headlands. So your, your Cape Grant, your Cape Nelson, your Cape Bridgewater, your Cape De Quince, you're going to look for volume of bait. You're going to look for activity. You're going to look for temperature changes. And you're going to try and mark barrels. I've marked up to sort of 12, 14 barrels a day in there some days this week. Um, eight barrels in, in 30 seconds have been on the screen. Um, so when you're on top of them, they're hungry. But you can be 50 metres off these fish and you won't even know they're there, Justin. Um, it's just these bigger fish don't always show themselves. Sometimes they're shown up with a kill slick. The amount of bait they're eating you'll actually see um, the oil that's leached out of the bait fish or, or out of the fish's uh, tuna's gills as they're eating has come to the top and create a slick, you know. Um, there's all little signs you need to, to look out for. And when in doubt, there's a great feeder schoolies there at the moment. So any of your small uh, 
cooler Uzis and Fluzies and stuff like that in your purples, pinks and blues have been going magnificent if you just need to break the boredom. Um, and, and you know, everybody's got a chance this weekend. I'm looking at that big light in the sky, mate. She's a full moon, so everyone take a ticket. There will be a couple of Barry's touched up in the next couple of days, no doubt. Uh, and thanks for giving that recommendation on the lures. And, look, again, Just Your Average Fish shows are un, un, non-sponsored and unbiased, but I have to say uh, our friends down at Complete Angler Ringwood that certainly look after me and... and and Dave as well, um, there is a mega amount of stock of Uzis and Floozies in those colours ready for barrel season, which we went gangbusters with through the store over summer on the local tuna as well. And they've got their four-day sale coming up starting tomorrow and I'm in store tomorrow to talk crap. So really looking forward to that. So absolutely support those ones that work. Um, all right, now let's have a Justin, look. Justin, if- before you, Justin. Go for it. Yeah, Lofty. He's a he's an industry stalwart. He is. I've seen him in fluoro undies. He's a magnificent <laughs> man. He's been around since day dot. Mm. We love him. Yeah. He, it's not just a promotion or anything. He gets in, in you get into his shop. You you're passionate with each other about the fishing. He's been doing it longer than any of us. My first job was at a complete Anglo Melbourne with similar people. Mm. I know what they're about and it's not cash for comment at all. It's just nah. you want to bloody enjoy your fishing like us. Go and see this fella and talk about it. Spend some coin and enjoy your sport. Don't yeah. don't walk out thinking you bloody need stainless steel undies. You know what I yeah. mean? That's all it's about. hundred uh, percent. Look, he's an absolute character. And uh, Steve, who's also an absolute character um, in a very different way, um, they're so passionate about their fishing. And in the six months that I've been working on their social media and their website with them, what I've learned hands down has put me on more fish and I don't necessarily share everything through the page because I do fish with my kids just by myself sometimes and and family and friends. Um, The information of supporting, it doesn't have to be complete Angler Ringwood, but certainly if you do, great, but any local fishing store, um, that's what you're paying for, you know, and and I'm sorry, you're just not going to get that at a BCF and Anaconda and it's nothing against them, um, but those stores are putting a lot of pressure on on those independents and even if they're part of, you know, a chain like Complete Angler or Tackle World, um, we've got to support them because that's the, they, you know, Ian has caught, you know, 500 pound marlin in Australia. He has caught, you know, 100 kilo tuna over his life and he's done it on rods and reels that are in his office and he's happy to break them out to show you that are literally the equivalent of a piece of two before pine with a whippersnipper handle on the end of it you know it's just it's phenomenal so but enough about that into the more questions um all right now this now i like this question because i was actually at sorrento many years ago where i think rip charters heard that there was a few whales coming through on um on uh, at apollo bay and they went out and smashed a 160 plus kilo barrel and i was launching as those buggers were bringing it back in to go out for gummies on the night and that's that was probably the defining moment for me to want to catch a barrel and that like that was just phenomenal and this question is a great question from ashley wilson you're going to start a war you're going to start a war why is that? It was pro-line charters. Oh, pro-line. Oh, start- <laughs> Come on, mate. Come sorry. on. <laughs> pro-line. All right. Sorry, pro-line. I disregard. <laughs> I disregard. Um, all right. I just, Ashley, thought I'd, I just thought I'd save you the grammar. No, that, no, no. Look, I get things wrong all the time. Don't worry about that. Do it live in front of thousands of people. Um, I'm human. All right. Ashley Wilson, we hear the odd barrel caught off Western Port or Port Phillip Bay heads, do you think if more people targeted them in these areas, would they get the results or these just random barrels travelling past yippa, yippa, yippa? All right. Um, now, Dave, I'll go throw to you with this one because you fish Western Port and then, and then Matt over to Port Phillip Bay. The, the, we've, we've already had a show with Richie and John Cahill talking about the local tuna, how ballistics it, it's gone. Um, what about big barrels offshore? Come on. Give us the scoop. Oh, that's a hurtful subject. Local barrels. Um, <laughs> I did. <laughs> we did get some um, when when that big run was on that you were speaking about, um, and then about another month after that happened, a couple of guys got them out off Western Port. Um, I didn't get one that year, but ever since then, I literally will go out there looking probably once a month throughout the year, almost every month. Um, yeah, they're certainly not consistent through there. As you can imagine, once you get into Central Bass Strait, a lot of those fish have either gone around the bottom of Tassie or 
um, turned around and gone back the other way. So your numbers <clears throat> aren't usually going to be as big as what you're going to get further west. They certainly are there. Um, nearly every time I go out there, I'll, I'll mark fish. Um, so, yep, they're certainly there. Um, and a couple of years ago, we had one on for two and a half hours uh, that we lost at the boat that was probably one of the biggest barrels I've ever seen. I would would have been over 150 kilo easily, and I usually undercall them. Um, and we broke the main line near the boat, which is very hurtful, and that is one of the ones that will curse me forevermore, forevermore until well, I can go and get one out there. A, a very close friend of mine who I know is watching the show tonight, G'day Dave, he's a helicopter pilot for uh, local uh, whales research and so forth, and um, he loves telling me of all the flights he's done and whales are coming into Western Port Bay this very week. Um, Ashley, Mr. Wilson, Mrs. Wilson, I don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Ashley, if you if you want to have a go, there are whales coming into Western Port Bay, humpbacks on their annual yep. pilgrimage at the moment. Go out off the shank and uh, how about you give it a go and you report back to us and maybe yeah. you might get that stonker that Dave missed. Um, yep. You know, because the whales are transiting through and, and if they're going to be there, fish the side of the whales, as Maddie said before. All right, Maddie. Now you're a, you're a Port Phillip Bay genius. If you're not catching uh, loads of snapper, you're catching loads of uh, tuna. What are your thoughts about catching a, a big barry off uh, Port Phillip heads? And if you're going to give it a go, when would you do it? Oh, just whenever the reports. Um, you've got to use the network out there. It's such flat ground, and the Fisher Transit like things. John Jabert got one not long ago. Um, in the recent times, with that uh, that bite. That was going on with ProLines Fish with Aaron Crombie on board. Um, you've just got to have the local knowledge. A lot of the guys keep it quiet and like to stick it up everyone else, and um, that's because the, of the lack of etiquette and respond, uh, respect shown when on the bite. You know what I mean? It, it's just everyone just gets in barrel fever and races for it, and you can't have lures out any any longer than thirty meters, or they get chopped up, and and the bite gets put down. So. It's a, it's just it's a catch twenty two. If it gets out, it's wrecked. If 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 not, a few can enjoy it, and that's why Portland's so good. Um, as Dave said, it'll just reset after this long weekend. You know what I mean? We'll go out the Tuesday or the Wednesday. Another front will come through. Um, the bait will, will move a little bit, and bang, it'll be on again. You know what I mean? It's the beauty of Portland. It's because the bait is feeding and and doing its thing here as well as um, getting pushed here. You know. Yep. Yep, sure. Look, um, just talking about boat etiquette, and we had a good chat about that in the last tuna show with Richie and John. Um, I couldn't more, uh, you know, agree with you there that certainly um, one thing it's to go get a boat and go fishing, but one thing to be able to support fellow fishers both in what you did during the week, Matt, with safety, but also in allowing charter people to do their jobs and run their spreads and catch fish for their clients. Um, you know, if you look at the local tuna season that we sort of just had, there was fish the size of the MCG dotted every five kilometres down the entire coast. Um, you didn't need to be fishing the same as everyone else. Um, give it some space. And I think, Dave, you had a fantastic video where you took out those um, bushfire sponsors um, with Brendan, and that was a fantastic show. I think you did 30 or 40 fish for the day. That was just mayhem. And, and you travelled, you know, quite a distance. You were marking them just everywhere. And I imagine that happens down at Portland as well. It's a big area. There's a lot of different fish holding areas. So um, find your own fish because, you know, even if you have 100 boats down at Portland, you can all go a different direction. And, and you know, fair enough, some will miss but uh, many of you might get onto some different pat patches. So um, we don't condone violence, but nothing's going to get a 20-ounce sinker in your boat windscreen faster than chopping someone's lines. So, you know, um, you know, think of it as social distancing uh, on, on, on the water. Um, give everyone a couple of hundred metres break because you don't need to be that close. Um, fair enough, the top water guys are a bit different, but they, they can cross a line and quickly tie a new lure, um, it, it, you know, and they're generally fishing um, with the wind, so they're casting the same direction. So, uh, yeah, give, give the guys some reprieve. Of, Go on, Matt. A lot of the boats have been coming just through the blind stuff, Justin, this year. Um, I used to be, you know, just pull my hair out, as you can see. I used to pull it right out, <laughs> trying to get the bait balls first. And... Um, the Sculpt Man, he's one of the best, you know, he's got this new stabie craft now and he's the best at marking fish and having his lures in a, in a barrel's vision that I've seen. And even that isn't working. The fish wise up, they don't come up for the strike. 
um, just in this cycle. They go a bit doughy and, and we're getting better results just going on the blind. So that's why we're sort of, sort of suggesting head west and deal with what you find rather than power west, look for Gannett Central where they're all just falling out of the sky and hang, <clears throat> hanging there because that's not happening as much now it is in isolated areas, but it's only lasting for 30, 40, 50 seconds. You know, if you get it going for five or eight minutes, you're lucky at the moment. You know, nearly every big workup is fizzled by the time we're getting there. So, you know, mm. re- rethinking it and, and running lures in different areas and just trolling through active areas um, rather than being Johnny on that on fire spot seems to be working a little bit better at the moment. No, fair yeah. enough. And tell me, um, Matt, um, we talked about bite times earlier and a few more questions have come through. Um, the morning bite can tend to be pretty short versus an afternoon bite. You're, you tend to run full day charters. Do you have a preference to whether it's morning or afternoon down at Portland? Oh, today I, I started late because of the weather, um, but the last last few shots have been um, first light, sort of 7.30, third rod in the water. So... Um, that's been pretty important if people want barrels. So, yeah, I've been concentrating on that. Having said that, there's been some brilliant fishing down here and we've all been sort of, after, you know, eight hours trolling around doing the same thing as each other, scratching our heads like fishermen do, we're not getting that afternoon delight at the moment. It's all looking good, but then it's just going, huh, at the prime time. You know, we're fishing till dark, but it's just, you're just not getting that hour of power. If you if you sort of know what I mean, yep, that sure. that the traditional barrel fisherman that hangs in dawn to dust banks on, and and what he's about because he's seen that that sort of um, uh, evening bite come on strong, but it's just not happening at the moment. It just seems to be that first time, you know, if you haven't if you haven't hooked up by sort of ten a.m., um, it's going to be, you know, um, school fish or or just. You know, hang in around the bait and see if Barry bites. But it's it's been fizzling the last couple of times. I've banked on the Arvo, put it that way. Okay. All right. Now, Dave, I've got a question for you. You know, I've seen you in at Complete Angler uh, Ringworld quite a number of times, and you know, you've bought some wonderful gear and lures. And you know, as you're building up your tr- your charter repertoire, um, question: If you boat a barrel after hours on mono, should you automatically get that uh, real re-spooled ASAP, or are you happy to use it for the rest of the season? Uh, yes, I do come into Lofty's quite often. We love Lofty. He's the best, looks after us. Um, and yes, definitely, definitely. Um, that's one of the other reasons I like to run a top shot. Um, if I get a big fish on that, I can just whip that top shot off. I don't have to replace the whole spool. Um, I'm in my little fishing shed here. I can probably turn the camera and that right there is my real spooler and a reel over here ready to get a new top shot on. So um that's 100 percent something that i do because in the past it has bit me in the bum um we've caught a big fish and and the line looked okay but it obviously wasn't and the next day we've gone out and we've pinged a fish off near the boat so that's one of those things you learn from with experience and hopefully i can save some of you guys the trouble yeah fantastic all right maddie and sort of similar question to you because you're running charters day in and day out and your gear is just getting absolutely punished, you know, because you're catching so many fish at the moment. What do you do? Do you, do you just pull some line off and chop it off? Or, you, you know, you're running uh, wind-ons? What, what's your sort of preference? Well, I've got about six kilometres here at the moment if you need some, Justin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's all yeah, no, I run, I run 100-pound top shot. Um, people say that's over the hill, but our lines are just dragged across the gunnels. They're stepped on there. You know, it's um, we had one the other morning. The bloody wind on wound up into the frame of the reel and chopped on the sharp edge of the crossbar. You know, um, just freak stuff happens when you're chartering, mate. Like, you know, stuff bends and breaks it doesn't normally, and rods get used upside down and wound backwards, and harnesses are put on upside down. It's just you never ceases to amaze. And any it, the most thing I the the thing with game fishing is efficiency. If anyone wants to go barrel fishing, set up your harness before you go. Put 12 kilos of drag over the rollers in the backyard. Get your mate to hang there for 10 minutes. Get the feeling. Find out which muscles are sore. Work on those before you come. Anything you can do to be efficient on this day of reckoning will 
will just help your cause so much more and let you enjoy it. You don't enjoy it when you're spent. You don't enjoy it when you've got to fight a fish longer than you have have to. You don't enjoy it when you, things aren't efficient, when your boat driver doesn't help you, he hinders you. Um, you certainly don't get help when it gets cut off after three hours because the bloke should have just turned right instead of left, you know. So just one percenters and, and make sure you've got a crew because it's a team effort every time. And that's what we specialise in with my crews. Like lately, we lose a lot of barrels, but I let my people do it. I don't don't have a decky that says stand back and watch me. You know what I mean? It's it's everybody's in. There's a guy going to grab the trace. Maybe it's my decky, but then then the bloke who's paying is going to be on the gap and his mate's on the rod and the other bloke's got the tail rope going and, and his mate's holding him behind, you know? And it's a real team effort and a, a, a pinnacle of our sport, as I said, and we like to respect it, you know? Sometimes they just get away and sometimes they... They, they uh, take you by surprise. Like I've had first first rod of the morning, short corner, plunger, lure, evil colour. Bang. I've, oh, gee whiz, I had the preset set at 20 kilos and it just snapped a 100-pound line like that first bite. And that's all That's all I heard was a crack, you know. Mm. But that's just human error. And I'll put that up every day of the week because I'm only human, mate. And doing as much efficient as I, I do, I've got to make some mistakes. It's just just the way of the road, you know. It's how you learn, mate. And, you, and there's one thing that Mother Nature will teach us all is that fish change and fish swim and fish feed differently. And, you know, when you think you've got it nailed, um, um, more for you because that's the first thing will undo you the next season. So, um, Dave, tell me um, – uh, here we go. Here's a great um, sort of question to ask. Um, you're one of the younger variety. Um, you've seen the introduction of tuna champions now. What are your thoughts? Do you think Tuna Champions is going to grab some momentum and and be be more readily um, sort of promoted across the social channels for people to understand how to respect these fish? So it's not always necessarily about bludgeoning as many fish as you can. Like um, you know, we've got to put them back. You know, you're only allowed you know a certain amount each. You know, in our bag limits. So Tuna Champions, how important do you think that is to bluefin tuna, mate? Oh, absolutely. It's it's wonderful. Um, it's it's there's nothing worse than when you see a boat come in with um, fish that have just been sitting on the deck, they're all crinkled and, you know, they might have been bled and that's it. You know, that's, if, if people say that bluefin's no good to eat, well, yeah, it's kind of likely that that's how it's been treated and and what do you expect? So anything that's going to promote looking after your catch is a good thing. We've definitely seen an increase um, over the last few years of, of people taking heed of that, including myself. Um, I was definitely guilty. I used to bring in barrels with their, their guts in them and, and probably not carry the appropriate amount of ice and, <clears throat> and cool bags and that sort of thing. And nearly everyone you see going out now, they, they carry all that gear with them and they bring the fish in gutted, um, you know, even though they're, gonna, they're not going to get that glory um, gantry shot of knowing the exact weight on the gantry it's you know it's certainly the way to go to look after the fish um just going back to that diver i showed a bit earlier the reason that does have that single on the back is in case i do want to release a fish um you know yeah the trebles are probably a more effective method but um i do i do want to release a few more barrels we've released a few now and you know not every fish is is um is up for being released but you know if we can then that's a good thing not everyone has to do it, but if, if you want to do it, then it's certainly a, a good thing to do. It's a very satisfying mission to go on. And, um, yeah, any, any, sort of, um, any sort of movement in that direction of looking after the fishery is certainly a very good thing. We, uh, yep. we, we don't um, – there's no problem with keeping fish, that's for sure, but if you're going to keep them, just make sure you look after them. And Dave, I didn't sort of ask you before your five key pointers, or three to five, or ten, or whatever it is, of someone of you know that you, if someone pulled you up at the ramp and said, "How do I go do this, Dave?" or what What are the defining things that you think are important to you for heading out for a barrel? Uh, make sure you try and get some sleep the night before. <laughs> um, you know, in the past we've driven all night, and you get there, and you're already half cooked by the time you get there, and that makes your decision making a little bit more difficult. Um, just, uh, make sure that, you know, all, before you even get to the ramp, all your gears a hundred percent. Um, I spend a lot of late nights here in, in my little fishing shed, um, rigging and making sure the one percenters are all good to go. Um, and then, yeah, when you get out there, um, use your eyes, your eyes, are, 
your biggest tool. Um, I've got pretty good long range vision and often I can spot like one gannet sort of diving in a particular way in, in, in the distance and um, I'll head over there on a hunch and, you know, there's a giant workup going on and sometimes that's all you need to be the first boat over there and you hook up. So, yeah, use your eyes, um, take note of every little thing that's happening around you and, um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Yeah, um, sure. Dawn to dusk, as we discussed before, put put in the hours and, um, yeah, just the one percenters. Fantastic. Well, and just going back on that Tuna Champions um, question, I don't think people realise the importance of um, Tuna Champions and particularly the amount of research that's gone into Tuna Champions and also aided by the work that um, uh, Al McGlashan's done and Dr. Sean Tracy down in uh, uh, Tasmania, uh, who is a, a, a professor in marine studies and has just put out one of the biggest southern bluefin tuna articles just the other day. I've attempted to get him on the last tuna show. I attempted to get him on this one. He's been very, very supportive of this show and what we're doing to fishing mm -hmm. and supporting quality fishing and looking after fish, but particularly the tuna. Um, uh, he, he's just been too busy to get that report out to come on, but hopefully we'll be coming on uh, in a future show. So we'll, we'll always keep the doors open for a future show. And we think we've got a few more to, to still uh, talk about a few different fish species. Um, I'm going to wrap us up there. And, and just before we do go, um, I'd just like to cover off both of your businesses because you've been great supporters of the Just Your Average Fish Show show. But really, if you want to learn and, and, and um, you know, see action from the most experienced people support their businesses by going fishing with them and 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 matt i'll just start with yourself you've been running matthew hunt fishing services for a very long time you have a very big capable boat down there in portland at the moment and um we're about to give away a fantastic prize for a four days charter but how would the people get in touch with you to book a charter mate and um and 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 get that happening just look us up on Facebook, Matthew Hunt Fishing Services, or um, 0409 008 441. Um, oh, sorry, 0409 760 510, I think it is. And yeah, 0419 008 441. There's two numbers there. Justin over, you know, I think Matthew Hunt Fishing Services was a, a you know, a scratch in the back of my head in the, in the early 90s um, when I was still working for dad. And, and it's just about, fishing the way I would fish. I remember charter boats being the old red boat out of St Kilda and you got given a bit of bait and a hand line and you went and caught 100 flatties and, you know, your snapper was so prestigious or whiting down at Western Port was just something you dreamt about, you know, and as the charter boats have evolved, you know, barrels have become the pinnacle and, and um, snapper the staple for me because they're fish, people want to target and... Um, there's only one of me. We're busier than we'd ever thought we'd be, but it's because we we do a specific thing and people pay us to go fishing, not wishing. And, yeah. um, you know, I don't have two kids. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have, you know, a wife. I've got a boat and a passion that will serve me a lifetime of memories. And uh, I, I get my thrills out of seeing people smile. I used to fish in competitions as a kid and I got really, really put off you know, being a measuring stick or, or having to beat this person or, you know, snarling because that person got a bigger fish or feeling inept. Whereas, you know, I get my joy out of smiles now and getting people fish they, they couldn't normally get unless they came out for a day with us. So, yep. you know, anyone who wants to come down and, and trial the tuna, feel free. Um, I've got a fairly big lead time because of this uh, COVID thing. <clears throat> I've been at Portland the last 13 years, I work out of there nine months of the year, whether it be for kingfish, tuna, sharks, whatever's on the go the best or whatever my people want to chase. Um, so it's not just the latest thing. I'm not just one of the Melbourne boys that come down or whatever like that. I've been um, living there for nine months of the year for the last 13. So pretty okay. passionate about the area. I love the fishery. It's always got better. That's why I've continued to promote it. And... Um, we want everyone that spends their hard earned getting their hundred thousand dollar rigs in with their their lovely tow vehicles down to get a reward for their effort to coming visiting visiting us, and um, you know giving the way the prize to the viewers is nothing to me because I love burling and that's all I'm doing. I'm creating a bit of burley for my clients um, to get some people that wouldn't normally get the chance to come down and experience the wild west, which doesn't always have to be tuna, Justin. It can be whales, it can be gannets, it can be terns, it can be seals, it can be 
um, weather conditions. It can be um, coastal structure. It's just a real buzz out for so many people on so many levels. And until you experience it, you can't really comment. So 100%. we love what we do, mate, and we love what you do, and that's why we're supporting you. To Someone had to stand up when we're all locked, bouncing off the walls in those shocking early times of COVID and you gave us a bit of light, mate, and here we are. We're right behind well, you. So and thank and you here guys we are, and thank you for your support. Now, Dave, um, uh, you're one of the newer charterers in in Western Port Bay, and you've got a lot of tuna knowledge, and and um, you also do a bit of guiding. Um, how do people get in touch with you to talk with you and and um, you know jump on board with you? Yeah, so there's the Facebook page, Dave Standing Fishing Services. Um, you know, we were just starting to get up and running there, and then COVID hit, so we've um, I've gone back to work my normal work for the time being um but yeah as we move into snapper season we'll be pretty full on into western port bay stuff um a lot of guys ask me about offshore charters um my boat is not in survey for offshore fishing so um i won't be running offshore charters unless we get a bigger boat down the track or something but um so that sort of stuff you've got amazing operators like matt richie etc um so yeah we'll be moving into snapper season Mulloway, gummies, whiting, all that sort of stuff. Um, so you can jump on on my boat. And uh, basically the aim is for people to come out and experience what we experience um, when we're filming New Fish TV. Um, and, um, yeah, we, I look forward to having everyone on board and hopefully um, we'll have a good rest of the season and we'll see Matt down on the West Coast there shortly. Well, absolutely. Now, without further ado, we're going to do this in a little bit of reverse. We're going to give away the big prize last. So our producer, you know, um, Ben from We Are Technical, he puts this, uh, helps put this show together. And Matt, you've you've said thanks to me, but I, I must say that without Ben and I coming up with this concept and, and his unique technology um, back facing into, into Facebook and, and Zoom and so forth, if you do have a big business, this is, you know, look, we're just fish shows, but this is a pretty professional cut. I couldn't have done it without him. And, and we're hoping to keep this show going, but because of people have seen what he's done, uh, he's booked out quite a fair way in advance as well. But we, we would love to come back with another show. I'm not too sure when it will be, but we promise Just Your Average Fish O's, keep following us for our unbiased reports um, and uh, we will get another show. And I, I would really like to get a Kingfish show together and a Mako show together. And here's two wonderful guests that uh, have a lot of experience in that area. So we'll, we'll, we'll do some further work behind the scenes on that. First of all, um, not so much the consolation prize, but Steve Lewis at uh, SFT Australia has given us two wonderful Takumi little uh, uh, diving lures. These are absolutely fantastic. Ben, I'm, if you rip down that picture, I'm just going to show one. Uh, it's in my hand right now. They feature owner trebles. Like these things look fantastic and they won't break the bank and it's something you can pitch at school fish and give them a crack. There's two of those and uh, the winner of those is Wade Jones, uh, obviously giving away a hard body to him because he asked the question, you know, do you run uh, extra treble so they can rate, rotate more? Excellent technical question. So Wade, if you just contact me through the Just Your Average Fish Shows page, Steve will send those to you directly and we'll get that sorted. All right, now to the complete angler ringwood prize pack, which is a squid teaser, a load of hard bodies, some of those Pakula skirts and a little daisy chain shotgun rigger, which uh, we've talked about on the show, or dynamite on the local tuna. There's some Jinkai 100 pound leader there, which is fantastic to start you off rigging. Um, this is absolutely fantastic. Thanks for the support of complete angler ringwood. And don't forget, they have their massive back to fishing stock take sale from tomorrow morning. I'm in store tomorrow morning helping out and on Sunday. So if you want to come down and talk just your average fish show stuff or get some bipartisan view, um, look, Lofty can teach us show so much as well, but we're going to be very, very busy and we do have COVID restrictions in the store. So we've still got to acknowledge that. But that price pack is going to Brock Eli. Fantastic, mate. You you spoke about the tuna and how much they eat in a day and, you know, how can you get them to go. Uh, if you, again, contact me through the Just Your Average Fish O's page, I'll get that express posted out to you straight away. Now, without further ado, I've got to announce the biggest prize that we've ever had on the uh, Just Your Average Fish O show. And both Dave and Matt, Matt, you've been so generous at lending your time. Now, the rules of this are... You've got a midweek charter, and it can be all day uh, for someone and, say, uh, three of their mates. 
and you've got to coordinate it with Matt because you're already booked out a fair way and you've got to coordinate it with Dave because Dave's going to be the deck hand and get Ufish TV on the go because we've got to support the Ufish TV channel. Um, this is Definitely. just going to be an absolute momentous occasion to have these two people working together uh, and fishing down at Portland. Now, you need to get your own way down there. If you need accommodation, you need to be able to book it. But midweek is when it generally fires because it quietens off a bit, as you've spoken about, Matt. And I think that Ben has chosen a really worthy winner because without looking after the fish and without looking after the, the continued conservation, which is really starting to be promoted on the social channels, um, it wasn't so long ago that southern bluefin tuna were, you know, super endangered and, and looking like they're going to die out of our local waters. So, you know, Nicholas Harrison, do you think with the introduction of tuna ta champions, will everyone respect the bluefin tuna more and, you know, will they treat it better? Absolutely. We hope that Tuna Champions with um, all of those Tuna Champions, particularly John Cahill and, and um, Richie Abella and anyone else who gets on board with Dr. Sean Tracy behind that is a fantastic thing. So massive congratulations, Nick. You are going to find your way down to Matty Hunt's Fishing Services at Portland with Dave and uh, jump on board with some of your mates. What a fantastic prize. So I'll connect you. Um, Nick, if you just want to send me your details via the Just Your Average Fishos page, and I'll connect you in with both Dave and Matt, and we'll make that happen. So uh, look, all I can say is thank you so much for the Just Your Average Fishos support. To yourself, Matt, you've given up your time. It's late, and I know you've probably got an early start, so thank you so much. Your, your passion, your enthusiasm, wearing your heart on your sleeve just means so much. And, look, if anyone's heading down to Portland over the next few days, I counted about seven tips there of where fish have been holding in the last week, and, you know, you, you're just so free with the information. Um, you know, Godspeed to you and, and much respect. Dave, thank you so much. You know, you've got your commercial adventures. Um, you know, you're working full time. You've got Brendan with uh, Ufish TV. Thank you very much for supporting us. And those videos on Ufish TV are absolutely entertaining and fantastic. You've got a monumental following on Facebook and, and YouTube. So certainly everyone follow Ufish TV. And thank you so much, Dave, for joining the show as well. Um, no worries. Wish you all the best in your endeavours. And we hope to, as I said before, to have another Just Your Average Fish Show show coming up. Um, and we're working behind the scenes on a couple of different ones, also not only fish related, but on a technical rigging basis. So uh, thank you to everyone. We're going to call it quits there. Prize winners, contact me via the page. And good evening. Bring on the Barrys.